Okay, and I've started the recording here. So if you would all bow with me with prayer, and then as we go along, we can all unmute and, and just move on. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, thank you for giving us your word. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to get together as brothers and sisters in Christ to study your word, to fellowship, and to take your word forward into the, the dark world. Please help us to be your shining light. Help us tonight to keep our minds and our hearts and our spirits open to you. And may, may we always be moved and directed by your Holy Spirit. In your son's holy name we pray. Amen. Good night again. I mean, good evening. <laughs> good night. Good evening, everybody. Um, so um, last week, of course, we did not actually have class because uh, my internet went, went completely toast. Um, and uh, so uh, two weeks ago, we covered Romans 7. Um, and I'm going to quick summarize that, and then we'll jump into uh, Romans 8. Uh, so in, in 7, what we basically had was beware, beware of legalism and trying to live by the law. Use the knowledge of the law to help yourself serve God in Christ. Do not serve the law itself. The law is useful and good, but we do not serve the law. We are guided by the law, but are not judged by the law. We are judged by Christ, and Christ does not judge those who believe in him, those that he knows. Although we don't serve the law we are not, and are not judged by the law, we should never be okay with our sins. We should look to mature and repent of our sins. And then finally, the relationship between God, the law, sin, and salvation are complex. However, however, ultimately, salvation is a grace offering from God through the blood of Christ. The offer is from Christ, God through Christ uh, and no other means. The only base requirement on us is to believe and to serve Christ. Okay, so tonight we're going to dive into um, chapter 8. So if you could go to open your Bible to Romans chapter 8. And like we usually do, we'll read through and then we'll work through it um, a few verses at a time. So, starting in verse 1. There is then now no con condemnation to those in Christ Jesus, who will walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of the life in Christ Jesus did set me free from the law of the sin and of the death. For what the law was not able to do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God, his own Son, having sent in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, did condemn the sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law may be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who, according to the flesh, the things of the flesh do mind, and those according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind of the flesh is death, and the mind of the Spirit, life and peace. Because the mind of the flesh is enmity to God, for to the law of God it doth not subject itself. For neither is it able, for those who are in the flesh are not able to please God. And you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God does dwell in you. And if anyone hath not the Spirit of Christ, this one is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body indeed is dead because of sin and the spirit of life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who did raise up Jesus out of the dead does dwell in you, he who did raise up the Christ out of the dead shall quicken also your dying bodies through his spirit dwelling in you. So then, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, but if according to the flesh you do live, you are about to die. And if by the spirit the deeds of the body you put to death, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive a, a spirit of bondage again for fear, but you did receive a spirit of adoption in which we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself does testify with our spirit that we are children of God. And the children also heirs, heirs indeed of God, and heirs together of Christ. If indeed we suffer together, then we may also be glorified together. And this is where Paul proves that he's a Southerner. For I reckon that the sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory about to be revealed in us. For the earnest looking out of the creation doth expect the revelation of the sons of God. For to the vanity was the creation made subject, not of its will, but because of him who did subject it in hope. That also the creation itself shall be set free from the servitude, the corruption, to the liberty of the glory of the children of God. For we have known that all the creation doth groan together 
and doth travail in pain together till now. And not only so, but also we ourselves, having the first fruit of the Spirit, we also ourselves in, in uh, I'm sorry, we also ourselves in ourselves to groan, adoption, expecting the redemption of our body. For in hope we are saved, and hope held is, be, is not hope. For what any one doth behold, why also doth he hope for it? And if what we do not behold we hope for, through continuance we expect it. And in like manner also the Spirit does help our weaknesses, for what we may pray for, as it behooves us, we have not known, but the Spirit himself does make intercession for us with groanings unutterable. And he who is searching the hearts hath known what is in the mind of the Spirit, because according to the God he doth intercede for saints. And we have known that to those living, I'm sorry, uh, and we have known that to those loving God, all things do work together for good, to those who are called according to purpose. Because whom he did foreknow, he also did foreappoint, conform to the image of his Son, that he might be firstborn among many brethren. To whom he did foreappoint, those also he did call, and whom he did call, those also he declared righteous, and whom he declared righteous, those he did glorify. What then shall we say unto these things? If God is for us, who is against us? Who indeed his own son did spare, but for us all did deliver him up? How shall he not also him all things grant to us? Who shall lay a charge against the choice ones of God? Is God he that is declared righteous? Who is he that is condemning? Christ is he that died, yea, rather also was raised up, who is also on the right hand of God, who does also intercede for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? According as it's been written, for thy sake we are put to death all the day long, we were reckoned as sheep to the slaughter. But in all these we are more than conquered through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor messengers, nor uh, principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things about to be, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God. That is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Okay, so let's go back to the top and let's do verses 1 through 4. There is then now no condemnation to those in Christ Jesus who walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of the, love in, in, of the life in Jesus Christ has set me free from the law of sin and of the death. What the law was not able to do, in that which was weak through the flesh of God, his own Son, having sent in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, did condemn the sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law may be fulfilled in us who did not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Okay, I have to like the fact that uh, the use of the word ver uh, flesh in verse 1 instead of law. Does anybody have um, where it says um, near the end there, who did not walk according to the flesh? Does anybody have the law in their translation? Troy, I can't hear you. You're on mute. Sorry. Yeah, okay. there we go. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Um, yes. I think that sinful nature is the is the common term you know, that in more modern translations today. Um, are you talking about in verse 4 where it says, live according to the, wait, who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the spirit? Is that, well, is that, that what? Actually, uh, I was actually talking about verse 1. Um, oh. But but that's that's fine. Um, yeah, I think I think the flesh or um, the uh, the nature. Uh, what, what was the phrase that you used in verse four there, Troy? Sinful nature. Okay, sinful nature. Yeah, I think those are are better than the law. Um, uh, I don't I think see that word in verse one though. Uh, where is it in yeah, verse one? Some of the translations do have that. I just wanted to I just wanted to make it clear that that um, any rate. Okay. So what does it mean to, and I'm quoting here, walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit? The simply saying that we believe meet the level of walking according to the spirit? I didn't understand the question. Okay, so 
That's simply saying that we believe. That, that we're, that to say, if I say I'm a Christian, that I believe in Christ, does that meet the level of walking according to the Spirit? No. No. Well, I agree. Why not? Walking according to the Spirit is doing what God has commanded us to do. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, David, yeah it, it, it all depends on what the meaning of the word belief. If you use the Bible definition of the word belief, then yes. If you use the common definition of the word belief, then no. Um, because in the Bible belief is different than what we usually say. You know, I, I believe that, you know, whatever Trump should win the election or what, whatever you believe, you know, that's it's not it's not Bible belief. So you yes, have to you have point. to understand what it meant. Yes, I like that. I think that's a good point. Yeah. And that's why I asked, you know, if I say I believe, right, that's necessarily the biblical belief, right? I can say anything I want. That doesn't mean it's true, right? <laughs> David, um, yes. verse 4 indicates, um, I'm, I'm looking at NIV, indicates um, it's also application of belief because it says who do, those who do not live according to the flesh. But according to the spirit, so it's an ongoing process. It's not just a, an expression of belief. Agreed. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So look at verse three. Does verse three say that Christ was sent in sinful flesh? No, in the likeness of sinful man, um, it says, in likeness, it doesn't say that he was sent in sinful in the likeness of sinful. In other words, he had a body. Yes, I think that's an important distinction. That's why I brought it up, right? Because I want to make sure that everyone gets that, that he came here in a body like we have that doesn't make him sinful like we are, right? Um, I think those are very different things. Okay, so um, and, and you can go back there or not. In Matthew 5, 17, Christ said he did not come to throw down, destroy, or abolish, however your thing is, the law. He came to fulfill the law. So what do you think of what verse 4 says, that the righteousness of the law may be fulfilled in us? If, if we're in Christ, Christ. It, what's that? It says it's because of Christ we, we, we are able to have the righteous requirement of the law fulfilled in us because of what Christ is. Uh, that is it. Um, yes. You might, you know, it's a, when, when he died on the cross, he condemned sin and sinful man. That's what it that's. That's what he did. Yes. Yeah, Dan. Well, the righteous requirement of the law was fully met. In other words, Christ completed the righteous requirements of the law. Amen. Yes. And so I think well, between, you might ask a further question. What was the righteous requirement of the law? Well, the righteous requirement of the law is that if you sin, you do what? You die. And that's what Jesus did in our place. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So if we're in Christ, doesn't it make, it make sense that the fulfillment of the law, that he is the fulfillment of the law, would also be in us? So if Christ is in us, if we're in Christ, doesn't it make sense that at some level that the fulfillment of the law would be in us also? Okay, let's look at verses. I agree, five. Let's look at verses five through eight here. For those who are according to the flesh, the things of the flesh do mind, and those according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For the mind of the flesh is death, and the mind of the spirit life and peace. 
because the mind of the flesh is enmity to God, for to the law of God it doth not subject itself, for neither is it able, for those who are in the flesh are not able to please God. So God gave us our bodies, so how can the mind of the flesh be enmity to God? I'm sorry, Troy, you broke up. Because it goes against God. I mean, it, the, 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 the flesh is against God. I mean, the, and I know that the NIV translates that sinful nature, um, and many a scholar has castigated that, but I, I really do believe that there's something to it. Uh, sinful na- I don't think sinful nature is a bad translation there. I think that, that when Paul uses the word flesh, he is not just talking about bone and, and sinew and blood. He is talking about the tendency that we have to sin. That's what he's talking about. And so I, I, I think sinful nature is a good translation here. Yes. Yeah, and, and that's my point. Is, and not, not necessarily about the differences in translations, but the, regardless of your translation, Paul is not talking about the fact that I have ten fingers and ten toes and a nose and a mouth and yada, yada, yada. He's talking about the sinful nature, that, as, as, uh, as Troy is pointing out. So what are the implications of not being able to please God if we are in the flesh? Or if we're living in our sinful nature, as, as Troy is putting it. Can't please him. Agreed. Yeah, Tom. Yeah, we're living for self above everyone and everything. We live for ourselves, and that's hostile to God. And that's how, you know, we are not pleasing to him. Yes, and what are the implications of not pleasing him and not not of being, living in a hostile manner to God? It's death. Yeah. Essentially death, right? Separation from God, right? Um, however you want, wish to phrase that, right? But, but yes, exactly, exactly. Um, yes, the opposite of salvation in our eternal relationship with God, right? All right, let's go to verses 9 through 11. And ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God does dwell in you. And if anyone hath not the Spirit of God, this one is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body indeed is dead because of sin, and the Spirit is life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who did raise up Jesus out of the dead doth dwell in you, he who did raise up the Christ out of the dead shall quicken also your dying bodies through his Spirit dwelling in you. Okay, I think that... um, Paul can be a challenging read sometimes, and I think this is this metaphor that Paul is winding here can get a little bit jumbled, but I think I'd like to work through it here. So in verse 10, he indicates that if Christ is in us, then our body is, is dead because of sin, or our sinful nature is dead. He is not talking in the real-time sense that our body is dead. He's talking about us dying to our sinful nature, which I think, according to you know what Jeannie said earlier, is essentially a lifelong process, right? In verse 11, he builds up the logical bridge that since Jesus was raised from the dead, so shall we. Here, Paul is talking about our spirit, our eternal soul, or whatever words you prefer. He's not talking about our earthly bodies, okay? Um, But when our earthly bodies die, we do not die the death with with that body. We live on with Christ. I think the message. Go ahead. Can I back up to verse 9 for just a second? Yeah, sure. It says, you however, are, yeah, sure. Are, you, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. If the Spirit of God lives in you, you not have the Spirit of Christ. He does not belong to Christ. Um, I, I just wanted to, to, to point that out. Um, we have the Spirit within us. This is another one of those passages that, that teach that. Um, and a matter of fact, it's saying if we don't have it, then we don't belong to it. And so, I mean, it's that important that we have that we have the spirit of Christ within us. That's why it says that we are not we're not controlled by uh, or we're controlled by the spirit and not the sinful nature. And so we we choose uh, to live our lives 
in such a way that we are catering to the spirit within us and not the sinful nature. It is a conscious choice to choose to live that way. Even though we are tempted to sin and, and often do, unfortunately, but that is not what we want to do. What we want to do is follow the spirit of the lead within us and be controlled by that. Yes, very much. Yes, thank you. Yeah, okay. Okay. Okay, so let's go let's drop down to verses twelve through fifteen. So then, brethren, we're debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if according to the flesh we do live, you're about to die. And if by the Spirit, the deeds of the body, you're put to death, we shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit of bondage again for fear, but ye did receive a spirit and adoption, which we cry, Abba, Father. So in verse 12, Paul says we are debtors. He says we are not debtors to the flesh. Does he specifically say who or what we are debtors to? I think it's implied. Yes, okay. So, yes, he does not specifically say, but it's strongly implied. And who is he strongly implying? <laughs> well, we're, we have a, a, an obligation to the, the, the spirit. He says if it's not, there's two things he's talking about here. He's talking about the spirit. And he's talking about the flesh. And if we don't have an obligation to the, to the flesh, then we have an obligation to the, the spirit. Yes, so, yes, it. yes. Yeah, and, and you can pick your, your pr preferred third of the, tri of the uh, triumvirate there, but one way or another, God, Christ, spirit, one way or another, um, that, that is the implication of, of it, right? So I particularly like Paul contrasting the bondage of fear versus the sphere of adoption. Um, but how are we to integrate these two ideas? So we're debtors to God and we're adopted children to God. How, what, what, how do you bring those two together? Well, go ahead, Troy. I don't think it's it's an uh, it's, it, I don't think it's a contradiction to say that we're children of God and debtors. Don't you feel in some way that your children are indebted to you in some way? I mean, when you're in a nursing home, don't you want them to come and visit you? You know, don't, don't you want them to take care of you when you get old? Doesn't the Bible say honor your father and your mother? Yes, it, yes, it so does. yeah, we're children of God doesn't mean we aren't debtors to Him. And by any stretch of the imagination. Okay, first I'm going to make a joke, and then, and then I'm going to get more serious. I say, yes, we would love our children to feel indebted to us, but, okay. Um, however, having said that, um, what I was coming to here, and this is just me, okay, um, is I think the, the, the being indebted is from our perspective, okay? We are and should feel indebted to God. OK, I don't think he's casting a, a pal of, of and Dan will get to you in just a second um, of dead upon us. I think that is, is incumbent upon us. But from God's gracious and merciful perspective, we are his children. So I think if you take it from his perspective, we're his children. From our perspective, we're indebted to him and we're still his children. Yeah, Dan, go ahead. I like the NIV version trans translation a little better. Obligated, obligation. Yes. We have to God through the Spirit to live according to His calling. Very good. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. So this isn't specifically written here, but do you think that God sees us as adopted children or more just like His children? Uh, Mike seems to want to answer that question. It does not matter a bit. Adopted <laughs> children are children. Oh, yes, of course. Yes, the father of an adopted child. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Who can answer that question better than that? Absolutely. Absolutely. There, there's one that comes to you through, through nature and one that you make a choice. And um, the, there's tremendous power in adoption. God didn't have to do that. He made the choice. Um, and for that, for that, we are 
whether we call him indebted or obligated or whatever, we owe him because he chose us. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, but let's okay. So let's take that earthly parallel for a moment now. And 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 I'm sorry, is is, is Hannah right there? I hope not. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so um, you made a choice to adopt her, right? And uh, and that's a powerful thing, okay? But do you really want her to feel more obligated to you because of that than than your son? In no way. No, right? Because to you, she's your daughter, he's your son. The only difference is that he's male and she's female, right? And he's older, <laughs> right? So, yeah. okay. And personally, I think that's how God sees us. I think, I don't think, you know, we're, we're his children. He just wants to have a relationship with us. All right, anything else on that? Yeah, Tom. It also implies that we are heirs of God, David. I mean, you know, and we're going to share as heirs of God in the glories of the kingdom and with Jesus Christ. So yes, yeah, so that's coming up in a few verses, yes. I'm sorry, Tom, go ahead. Did we lose you, Tom? That's Okay, okay. All right, so then, great. So let's go on to verses 16 and 17. Um, the Spirit himself does testify with our spirit that we are children of God. And of children, also heirs, heirs indeed of God, and heirs together of Christ. If indeed we suffer together, that we also may be glorified together. So Paul comes back to this concept that if we are in Christ, then we share with him. We share in his suffering, we share in his resurrection, and we share in his glory. In general, and specifically in ancient Hebrew culture, did a child who was an heir have, have to do anything to earn that inheritance? No, right? If you're the eldest son, you inherit. You could be the biggest creep on the planet. You inherit. <laughs> okay? You didn't have to do anything, okay? Um, does that kind of parallel our salvation? Do we have to do anything to, to earn our salvation? No, I mean, we have to have faith, we have to accept Christ, but we don't earn our our, our, our heir to, to Christ, right? No. Okay, so before, so before we leave this, I want everyone to think a little bit, because I think it's pretty important, about the awesome nature of the fact that God has made us heirs, okay? Um, it's nice and well that I was an heir to my dad and, you know, and all that and, and all that good stuff, but to be an heir to God, uh, that's, you know, that's just an awesome concept. You know, the great I am, the creator and Lord of the universe, the omniscient, omnipresent, om, omnipotent God of everything, deems us his heirs. Um, I think that's an incredibly strong message to us. Troy, you look like you have something to say. Well, yeah, I did. I, you, you are very perceptive, brother. Because, um, yeah, I, I was thinking of a parable that Jesus taught, uh, the parable of the... Um, of the workers in the field. Um, the if, if you look there, the payment that was given, especially, of course, to the ones that were hired later, is not commensurate with the the work that was done way in the kingdom. Um, God just chooses to be generous to us. And I think that's the point. You know, we, we he chooses that because we are his children. Uh, and And that that metaphor was chosen because it matches up you know it's it's there and i think it's a wonderful thing yes. um i talked with two people one of them thought one of them was disturbed by it and the other thought it was the most wonderful parable in the world um and the one that was disturbed by it i probably would do more the one who thought it was the most wonderful parable in the world was a very humble man. That he, 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 even though he's he's been in the church all his life, he equates more with the people that were hired later than the high people. Anyway, but just a thought. No, and, and I think I think sometimes I think it's kind of um, a self test on 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 our maturity. Sometimes if we've been Christians for a long time, the concept that someone could essentially come to Christ 
on their deathbed and, and, and you know, and be granted the same salvation that, that someone who's a lifelong Christian. You know, it's like, sorry, wrong, wrong, wrong perspective, you know, wrong way to look at it. It has nothing to do with how long you were a Christian, right? Um, Dan, did you want to say right. something? You're just shifting. Okay. All right, so let's go to verses 18 through 22 here. And like I joked as we came through here, so this is where we get convinced that Paul's a Southerner because he starts off with, for I reckon, okay? You got to put in your best, uh, you know, Southern accent when you do that, which I can't do, sorry. But, for I reckon that the sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory about to be revealed in us. For on the earnest looking out of the creation doth expect the revelation of the sons of God, for to the vanity was the creation made subject, not of its will, but because of him who did subject it in hope. That also the creation itself shall be set free from the servitude of the corruption to the liberty of the glory of the children of God. We have known that all the creation has grown together and does travail in pain together till now. So what is Paul's basic message in these verses and in this uh, fairly long sentence here? There's a lot. <laughs> yeah, but at a high level, what's 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 if I if I gave you one word, what would you use? Only gonna get better. What's that? Are what'd you, you say here? Somebody's saying something. Okay, well, this kind of in modern vernacular, the best is yet to come. Okay. 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 Yeah, my one word answer to that was hope. Okay. There's suffering and travails and all that good stuff. However, the glory of God and the amazing gift of salvation is so much greater than these sufferings and travails uh, that we can't even begin to overshadow the glory of, of what God is, is uh, planning for us. Okay, verses 22 to 25. I'm sorry, Troy, do you have something? Yeah, I just thought it's an interesting aside here. The, the, the creation itself is subject to bondage to decay, is what is the term that was used. And I think that scientifically bears out. It's the, it's the concept of entropy that says that, that, that everything is moving to a constant state of disorder. And, and I think that, that it is. And I think that's that bondage to decay that eventually it's going to end. It's going to go. It's, it's not going to be forever. So. Yeah, Troy, you and I will have to have uh, some uh, discussions about thermodynamics someday. <laughs> sure, I'll be happy to. <laughs> that was that, that was my graduate work. Um, okay. Okay, verses 23 to 25, we will not bore people with uh, entropy and enthalpy and thermodynamics and all that stuff right now. <laughs> um, so it's 23 to 25. And not only so, but also we ourselves, having the first fruit of the Spirit, we also ourselves in ourselves do groan, adopting, expecting the redemption of our body. For in hope we are saved, and hope beheld is not hope, for what anyone doth behold, why also does he hope for it? And if what we do not behold, we hope for, through continuance, we expect it. So is Paul saying, at least in part, that we shouldn't be hoping for salvation, we should expect it? I think that's what his word hope here is. Uh, it, it's not hoping the Braves are going to go 59 and one in a 60 game season. It's it's I expect. I just wanted to make sure Dan was with me. Hope, hope is a uh, uh, is confident expectation. Biblical hope is confident expectation. Yes, but here I think he's actually. He's referring to actually when he, at least in, in my translation, um, he's calling out a more human hope here, and he's 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 contrasting it with expectation, right? And I think basically what he's saying, yeah, yeah, Mike, go ahead. No, I was just going to say there, there's kind of a yearning. Yes. Yeah, I think um, the expectation is not as one that is owed, 
but as one who has been given a promise that is assured by the most faithful and trustworthy source in the universe, God himself. Um, and so I think that's where the expectation comes from, as opposed to a hope, which is, yeah, the, the Braves might win tomorrow, but probably not. <laughs> yeah, 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 Mary, go ahead. And then, and then Troy. Uh, when you talk about expectation, uh, David, and it made me think about a psalm, and I think I wrote that down when well, I'm doing one of my devotional Psalm 5 3. Say, in the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my request before you and wait expectantly. Expectantly, yes, yes. Expecting an answer, yes. Yeah, Troy, go ahead. Yeah, I think here. There's the tension between the, the I don't know exactly how to put it, the, the then and the not yet. The then, uh, that, there's other ways to put it. Uh, uh, Mike, if, if you remember this, but help me out, but it's, the, it's that tension between something, it's the, 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 re, the hope that's realized is, is no, converts from hope to realization. But then we're not there yet. So right now it's still hope. But it's still confident expectation. Yeah, so you've got the already and the not yet. I'll just. That's right. That's it. Yeah, that tension. Yep. Yep. But again, I think the point here is, is that it's not that maybe kind of sort of hope. It's that confident hope, right? Um, yes. If God has promised this, it's going to happen. We may misunderstand how it's going to happen, but it's going to happen. Yeah, Mike. David, that, does, that doesn't stop us from uh, in our in our weak moments from saying, "Oh Lord, how long?" Yes. It, it doesn't mean that we've lost that expectation that it's going to happen, but there are those moments. It's like, "All right, Lord, why not now?" <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Okay, so let's go to verses twenty six and twenty seven. And in like manner also, the Spirit does not help our weaknesses. For what we may pray for, as it behooves us, we have not known. But the Spirit himself does make intercession for us with groanings unutterable. And he who is searching the hearts has known what is in the mind of the Spirit, because according to God, he doth intercede for saints. So is Paul saying that God answers prayers not prayed? Uh, no. He's not saying that, but he does. Uh, no. Yeah, it, it's, it's, they're prayers that are not known how to be prayed. Um, and, and I don't think this takes away our responsibility for prayer. Um, I mean, we shouldn't look at this and say, oh, well, I don't really need to pray because I don't know what to pray for anyway. No, we do our best, and God fills in the blanks. Uh, he fills in the, um, the, 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 the un, un, unsaid parts. But we need to still, you know, when it says, when it says with groans that words cannot express, that's the spirit doing the groaning. That's not us doing the groaning. That's the spirit. He does, the, he does that. We do our best to pray. Yes. It yeah. First of all, it doesn't always come out the right way. Yeah, Dan. You know, two of the greatest promises to Christians are found in this chapter: the Spirit intercedes for us, and Christ intercedes for us. We got more help than we know what to do with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, I think that's unfortunately extremely true. <laughs> no, it's, it's good. It's good. We need it. But sometimes we don't know what to do with it, and, and, and therefore we're a bit of a loss. Um, so, yeah, yeah, yeah I would agree. So I'm going to say that I think that in a manner of speaking, um, yes, God does answer unasked prayers. I, I totally agree with Troy that we are instructed to and we are we are supposed to pray, Okay. But sometimes God knows what, well, all the time, God knows things about us that we don't even know ourselves, right? And so there may be some prayer that if we were in better touch with ourselves, we would pray, but we don't because we're, we're human, 
Okay. And I think God and the spirit are more than capable and more than happy to intercede and fulfill prayers that if we knew better, we would have asked for, but that we actually didn't. Now, I still having, I'm going to circle back though. I think that Troy is absolutely right. We are instructed and expected to pray. Yeah, Tom and Ty, go ahead. Yeah, it says that he's constantly searching our hearts. So once again, the spirit does intercede for us, but God is constantly searching our hearts and our minds, you know, for things that, that, that we need. You know, he is our father and the spirit is going to intercede for us on his behalf because he knows what we need before that. So we have this help to go ahead and get that help from him. Yes, yes. Just, just so going down, I think it's near the end of those, uh, yeah, uh, 27. Um, who does Paul say God will intercede for? Saints. Saints. And who is that? Is that the team in, in, in Louisiana? That's us, brother. That's us. Yes. yes, yes. That's another team that's not likely to win, but we won't go there either. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, yes. Yeah, so, we talk about saints and talk specifically about believers. Talk about people like you and me, hopefully. Okay. Um, verses 28 through 30. And we have known that to those loving God, all things do work together for good. To those who are called according to purpose. Because whom he did foreknow, he also did forepoint, comfort to the age of his um, of his son, that he might be firstborn among many brethren. And whom he did forepoint, these also he did call. And whom he did call, these also he declared righteous. And whom he declared righteous, these also he did glorify. Okay, so this is one of those sections in the New Testament that Calvinists love to refer to to push the idea of predestination. Okay, is Paul saying that God shows winners and losers, so to speak? God chose everybody to be a winner if they would do what he asked them to do. I would agree with that. Yeah, Troy. Yeah, I, I think the whosoever will applies. Now, you might say, what do you do with those verses that actually use the word predestined or, or uh, foreknew or the, things like that? Um, and, and I will I will tell you that I think that he foreknew the church and we chose to be a part of the church. And the, the church has been predestined uh, to be, you know, his his bride. The church has been predestined to do those things. And he has given us a choice to be part of that or not to be. Yes. And Jesus said, G Jesus said, wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction and many there be that follow it they chose to do that and so anyway that's my i think no, I agree. i'll also point out that so verses 28 29 and 30 they're one sentence and the sentence begins with and we have known that to those loving god all things do work together for good so this is something that talks to the point of us choosing right not predestination Yep, Troy. Love, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Okay, love is a choice, and I would defy I would defy anybody to 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 define it any other way, uh, because it's not really love. I mean, that's 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 the bottom line. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Um, yeah. So I think um, that. Particularly, uh, verse 28 is a big part of our calling as Christians, right? Um, we're to those we're called according to purpose, right? We're called to do God's will. Okay, so let's take 31 just as the one verse. What shall we say unto these things? If God is for us, who is against us? Of course, this is a very famous verse. It's a very um, important concept. Um, what do you think God's main purpose for giving this verse is to us and making it so famous? Why is this a verse that we virtually all know? Yeah, Dan. 
face a lot of adversity in life. We sometimes feel that the world is against us, opposed to us, like to get rid of us. Uh, and it's, it's a comfort to know that no matter who's against us, God is for us. He doesn't forsake us. Yeah, yes, I agree. Yes, yeah, Troy. There's, there's a saying that says, God and me make a majority. And I think that's kind of what's getting at here. Uh, it doesn't matter. It's me making majority, but yeah. God and me make a majority. Uh, it, it doesn't matter how, who else is out there against me. If, if, if God's on my side, then, then I'm, I'm, the, I'm, I'm the favorite here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think to Dan's point, I think one of the reasons that we cling to it, but also that God specifically gave this to us, is to remind us that although there will be trials, there will be difficult times, that he is with us, and that no matter what else, having him with us essentially conquers all because we will be with him for eternity. Yes. Yeah, Mike. Um, just, just to emphasize the radical nature of that idea that the creator of the universe would, would not be straining against us, would not be withholding from us, would would not be in opposition to us, but, but the, this is a life transforming concept that Jehovah God is for you, desires your best. Now that may not be what we think is best, but he desires what's really best. And it, it's a radical idea that, that we should just bask in and, and thank God for each and every day. Amen. Amen, brother. Amen. So with those perspectives, what's the key counterpart, a concept here that's for us? Okay, so if God is always with us, and I'm not going to let you get away with just saying, yes, yeah, so we have to be with God. Yes, okay, that's great. Okay, but if God is always there for us, what is the key concept for us that goes hand in hand on our side? What do we do? Do we take control of the situation? Do we do we lay claim to it? Draw near to him. What's that? Draw near to him. Draw near to him, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Um, yeah, what I what I had here was I'll go ahead, Troy. Yeah, in response to what Mike was just saying, the radical nature of this should cause us to have a radical response back. I mean, the fact that God is for us, that, that is a statement of grace, by the way. It's a statement of grace. It's favor. God has favored us. Um, that should cause us to want to serve him. I mean, that should that, that should bring out a response within us. Yes, and, that, and that's where I was trying to, to go to. Thank you, Troy. Is so, as Mike said, we have this radical concept here, and it requires a radical response. And normally, the way to take control of your life from a human, you know, earthly perspective is to go out and jump on it, get on top of it, take control of it, all that stuff, right? And what God is telling us is like, no, surrender to me. Okay, come to me. All right. Um, I and 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 I will protect you. Listen to me, right? Keep your ear open to my leanings. And in the context of what we're studying now and what Mike was teaching this morning is we keep our ear open to the Holy Spirit to be guided to go forward and do what God wants us to do, right? As opposed to, well, I'm going to do what Frost wants to do because it's always worked out pretty good for me. And uh, besides, I'm me and I said, blah, 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 right? Now, nah, that's, that's a good way of getting yourself in trouble real fast, right? Particularly if your name is Frost. Okay, anything else on that one? That's All right, so now let's finish it out here. Let's go 32 through 39. He also indeed his son did not spare, but for us to deliver him up, how shall he not also with him the, all things grant to us? Who shall lay a charge against the choice ones of God? God is he that is declared righteous. Who is he that is condemning? Christ is he that died, yea, rather also was raised up who is also on the right hand of God, who also does undercede, intercede for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? 
According as it's been written, for thy sake we are put to death all the day long, we reckoned as sheep of slaughter. But in all these we more than conquer through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor messengers, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things about to be, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, Paul may have left something out there, and it's not this, not that, but basically he's giving a pretty all-encompassing, it's not any of that stuff, right? Basically he's saying, there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God, okay? Um, however, there is one thing that can separate us from, from the love, of, not from the love of God, but that can separate us from God, and, and who or what is that? Dan. Us. <laughs> A simple two-letter answer, us, right? Yeah, Troy. Yeah, you know, um, I, I I hesitate to bring this up because I, I, I really feel that this is a very encouraging verse, and, and it is. And I, I have great comfort in this verse, knowing that, that God's disposition toward us is defined here. But John 3.16 is another verse, and it says, For God so loved what? the world. Um, and we know very well that not the whole world is going to be saved, but God loves the world, and Jesus died for the whole world. But that doesn't mean they're going to be saved. So we have to understand here what, what it's being talked about. Now, I believe that he's speaking of Christians here in the way that God loves us as Christians, but we can choose to turn around and go back into the world. Uh, love is still a choice. And it is after we become a Christian, and it is just as it was before we became a Christian. And we can choose, we could become the prodigal son if we wanted to. You know, that's why that parable was there. Um, so, anyway. David? Yes, yes, Jeannie. Um, I think the comfort that's offered in these verses is just spectacular. Um, you know, on the one hand, there's the, the, uh, prosperity theology that teaches, you know, if you're, if you're good, if you're a believer, then all things are going to work for you. Um, but God is clearly telling us right now that's not the case. Um, we are going to share in all the sufferings and tribulations. I mean, look what he allowed, um, how he allowed his own son to suffer. So, yes, yes things are going to befall us. But... In spite of that, he's still there supporting us. And I mean, the, just the picture of that comfort is is tremendous. I agree wholeheartedly. Yes. Like I said, I mean, it's a long list of, of pretty ominous, awful things that are against us. And basically, Paul is saying, yeah, and none of them can, can will take God's love away from you. Okay. Um, nothing can overcome the love of God. And his audience, direct audience, was really facing severe persecution, just like in many of the areas of the world today. Not so much in America, but... No, no. Yes, we sometimes... Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I just said it, it is still current. It does exist. Yes. Right. Yes. David, could I say something? Uh, I would say this is a great scripture for what we face today. I think the New Living Translation says, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Uh, and, and I think what it really says here is, you know, I can't control what's happening around me, but I know the one thing that nothing can stop me from if I follow God, be with him one day in paradise. And I, I think that's really what the message to me is, is. It helps us understand that nothing can take that away from us. If we do the right things, nothing can take it away from us. Amen. Very good. Okay, so in summary, um, what I've got here, um, and you may have other thoughts. So do your best to live like Christ, to, to be like Christ. If we are in Christ, the fulfillment of the law will be in us also, just like Christ. The concept of not being able to please God if we are in the flesh, separation from God, what is eternal, is uh, how many define hell. The opposite is, uh, of salvation would be uh, would, I'm the opposite of salvation, which is eternal relationship with God. 
If we are in Christ and our sinful nature becomes dead to us, we were ransomed through the sacrifice of Christ, his only begotten son. We have become children of God. From our perspective, we are debtors. From God's gracious and merciful perspective, we are his children. If we are in Christ and we share with him, we share in his suffering, we share in his resurrection, we share in his glory. The great I am, the creator of the Lord of the universe, the omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent God of everything deems us heirs of his. The glory of God and the amazing gift of salvation is so much greater than the sufferings and travails of this life. The expectation of salvation is not one as one owed, but as one who has been given the promise that is assured by the most faithful and trustworthy source in the universe, God himself. God answers prayers, even prayers that we can't quite put together, and um, God is with us, uh, but we need to surrender to his power and wisdom. And there's nothing in this world, no matter how awful and how terrible we may feel about it, that will take God's love away from, uh, uh, you know, away from us. Um, that we are the only thing, our, we are the only barrier between us and God, really. All right, any other thoughts about what we read through tonight? Good chapter. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so next week we'll be in Chapter 9. Um, by the way, um, I'm going to remind something that Mike said earlier today. So, Mike, tell me if I get this wrong. Please uh, please tell me if I'm wrong because I don't want to get this wrong. You were talking about being in John Chapters 14 through 16 for the next couple of weeks, right? Correct. So, always good to read uh, Romans 9 before next week, but, uh, but reading John 14 through 16 would be even better. <laughs> okay? So, because we'll go through verse by verse on uh, Chapter 9 next week. All right, everybody, if you'd all bow with me in a, a quick uh, prayer to dismiss us here. Heavenly Father, thank you for being with us together tonight. Thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for your word and the wisdom that, that you provide to us. Thank you for the insights into our lives. Thank you for the uh, fellowship that we have and that, and that we get to share together tonight. Please help us to go forth and to represent you well and to be your shining light in the world. In all things, we may, may we be your servants. In your son's holy name we pray. Amen. Good night, everybody. Right. Thank you, David. Right, thank yeah. you. Love you guys. Love you too, David. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. David, you want to talk about thermal?